So uh, in, just in my introduction before, as you are aware, I wear two hats. Um, I actually have another uh, couple of hats that I'll just throw into the pool just, so that, just to put things into context. Um, I'm also a farmer, so I'm a farmer elected member of the Fonterra board. And on our farm we have dairy cows, obviously, um, but also we have sheep, beef, deer, forestry, um, grow a lot of grass. I told that to a Californian once and he was asked me after, after thinking of it for a while, do your animals get really hungry after they eat all that grass? <laughs> I realised we were on a different plane at that stage. Um, and on that farm we are members of, I think, six cooperatives. Um, and so I'm very much a cooperative person, which is, is a little bit of a challenge as an academic, because as an academic you actually have to have a balanced view. Um, so I, I'm a little one-eyed when it comes to the cooperative, um, but I'll try and provide a balanced view in terms of sustainability. So when I was asked to speak around sustainability of producer cooperatives, I lent on my academic um, background uh, to think about well, how would I define sustainability and what are some of the key issues that really are, um, would need to be addressed uh, objectively when looking at a cooperative going forward. <coughs> So the first one to recognise is that sustainability is actually about long term, not short term. So we have a long term business model, we've got that by default in a cooperative. It's one of the beauties of a cooperative, similar to a family business, is that we actually have a long term view of the world. And so this sort of short term, somewhere someone this morning mentioned short term opportunism. We're structured to actually discourage short term opportunism. We are actually about the long term. It's a social construct. Uh, my young, youngest son um, has just started a, a, a commerce degree down in Otago University and one of his papers he's doing was organisational structures. I said to him, well, they, if they, have they introduced you to cooperatives yet? And he said, well, no, tell me about them. And I just gave him a brief example and, and he said, oh, sort of, that's quite a socialist construct. And I said, well, it is actually. It, it is a, about an egalitarian uh, construct in which we have this sort of member value proposition. So the equality, the egality, egalitarianism that actually sits within that cooperative uh, construct is a critical part of its business model. It is generally formed as a response to market failure, and Michael mentioned that this morning. And so we know as farmers, we are weak buyers and weak sellers. Even the biggest farmer is still a weak buyer and a weak seller. Um, and so traditionally, and I, meant, and I go over this with my students using the five forces framework to point out that in fact if we want any power in the marketplace it has to be by grouping together. We have to um, create some sort of construct that enables us to have some power. There is always a link between activity and reward, activity and control, and so whether it's kilograms of milk, uh, kilograms of wool, the amount of fertiliser we buy, there's a connection to um, the activity that we have in any one of our cooperatives and the, and the reward that comes from that activity. And then finally, and this is a bit that I particularly like and I've been able to observe firsthand in the last three years um, with, on the Fonterra board, is that we've got this wonderful healthy tension. It's really rare in any business for somebody as a management person to be told, you will pay the most you possibly can for that input and you'll make a profit. I mean, it's a, it creates a wonderful tension and, and drives a uh, fantastic efficiency, I believe, in that model. So we have the long term, we have an efficiency, efficiency drivers in there, um, and we have this sort of egalitarian construct within that business model. The other thing around a cooperative in terms from a sustainability framework is this one around stability um, and evolution. I actually had the word growth in there before I listened to Michael before, and it is actually about evolution. It's actually about how that cooperative, from a stable base, um, builds and adapts to the environment as it changes around it. So we've got, um, in general, most cooperatives have permanent capital, um, and from that permanent capital, they actually, that provides them with stability to actually have that long-term view and actually take the business forward. It is about asset utilisation and loyalty as well. One of the, um, one of the things that is, is particularly strong around a cooperative, it tends to be a more a feature of perishable product cooperatives, I must add, um, and that is that the asset base is generally fully utilised. It's part of that loyalty um, aspect of the cooperative. 
In terms of long term, it's also very intergenerational and the resilient side. Someone mentioned resilience earlier on this morning. So in terms of resilience, there's a wonderful quote in The Economist a little while back, that it, resilience is something that's able to bounce without breaking. So if we can bounce without breaking, it means we've got a business construct, and we've heard it in the banking examples just before lunch. We actually can manage um, volatility. We can bounce without breaking because of the construct that we've got, the longer term view, um, and the, the way that we actually uh, organize our, our business. And that structure also protects us from this short term opportunism that I mentioned, mentioned earlier on. So one of the other advantages of having multiple hats is that um, you can actually, um, you're, you are able to work with some amazing students like Goujon, who spoke earlier on today. Uh, where we had, I think in the last couple of years we've had five or six postgraduate students who've come in all saying I want to study cooperatives. And so their, their um, thesis work has actually meant they go away and they delve into all the literature and they quote Michael Cook extensively, um, <laughs> along with a raft of uh, other sort of angles on the world, and come back with, well, this is our understanding. They then apply it, whether it's to cooperatives in China, uh, Malawi, Zambia, Papua New Guinea, um, all around, wherever these people have come from, sometimes from New Zealand as well. We do get some <laughs> Kiwi students. Um, and then from that, you get this, this, this great sort of depth of understanding of what not only what cooperatives are, but also how different they can be. There isn't one cooperative model. Um, but I did have a student a little while back who said, I really want to find out what's different about a cooperative and a corporate. Um, Michael went over some of that difference earlier, but this student went through, dredged through everything and said, but in any example I come up with, I find a corporate that's doing the same. So where are they different? How are they different? And the one thing that he came through with absolutely fundamentally that was the point of difference was mutuality. And that in a cooperative, it is actually about that collective good, that mutual benefit. The reason that you work together is in fact that the, the sum is, is greater than the, sorry, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and it also, we meant this morning, a few people talked about things like social cohesion and that balanced interest of factions, uh, which has its challenges, but it is actually about creating uh, that opportunity for mutuality to be realized. So that is critical difference, and that's why people become members of cooperatives. Now there's a wonderful uh, quote in New Zealand um, in Maoridom around what really matters in business, and I, it, it's in English, it's people, people, and people, and I think in cooperatives, uh, that's absolutely key to the, we the, the strength that the cooperative has going forward. So it is that connectivity, we talked about local this morning, talked about loyalty as well. Um, and I, what I particularly love, and I must admit in the last couple of weeks there's been a lot of this, in, in the Frontera at least, is the debate and the passion, the vibrancy, the fact that people Believe, uh, they are members. This isn't just somebody they sell their product to or buy their product from. This is something they own. And they really have a, 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 a key, um, intense desire to discuss that ownership and that control. And that's what keeps cooperatives alive, keeps them very, very vibrant, and enables them to do the things that um, Michael was talking about. How else can you tweak? How else can you reinvent unless you have that real buy-in around the discussion and the debate of what that reinvention should look like? I added this from listening to Michael this morning as well, this other comment around civility. I really liked the sound of that. We cooperatives make the corporate world, no, the business world civil. They make society civil. Maybe they make us civil. I'll have to remind that some, to uh, groups of farmers I speak to sometimes who can get a little irate and wag their fingers when you're discussing different issues, but it is about civility. It's actually about taking the social contract construct beyond the individual, um, which is that sort of mutuality side of things. Finally, um, leadership is an absolute key, and I'll give the the reason, well, not the, not the reasoning for that, but one of the examples of that is actually in Gujong's work that was talked about this morning, is that in those two cooperatives that he worked with, the key to both of those was actually the person, there was one individual in both cases, who actually drove that cooperative forward and, and collected everybody's enthusiasm around him and his governance team and actually took that forward. So leadership in a cooperative is 
absolutely essential if that evolution that Michael talked about is going to happen. So it has to be visionary, but it also has to have controls wrapped around it. Because those controls, and there's some amazing examples in the literature for cooperatives that have actually forgotten to have controls. Somebody this morning talked about governance is, is, is knowing how to manage the managers. And I looked across at some of the Fonterra managers in the room at the time. Um, because that's actually about, it is actually about having those controls. So if you look at some of the ones that have failed, it's because sometimes management either hasn't been controlled or governance hasn't been strong enough. Um, and it's about setting, getting that balance uh, to make sure that that evolution can actually happen. Uh, maintaining the balance reciprocity, I like that term balance reciprocity that came out this morning, the social capital. Um, we mustn't forget that that social capital is, is uh, in essence the way we measure our, mutual, our mutuality, the way in which we actually believe that we're in the right place by being in that cooperative. And then the last point, which is also a leadership function, um, or an outcome really, is this one that takes civility beyond the individual, beyond the actual firm, out into, the, uh, into society at large, and that's the corporate responsibility side. And this morning we had com that, we, that was described as, described as generalised rec reciprocity, um, but most specifically ended up with a trusted institution. So if that cooperative can go beyond, take that civility out into society and ends up being a trusted institution, then maybe we get um, the, the response from society that actually says, actually, I like cooperatives, I like what they do. I can see there's a benefit to me even though I'm not a member, which is sort of the, the wider outcome of the cooperative. And that was my summary. Thank you. Thanks.